Haichka, Haichka, CM, Ziaya. Greetings and welcome, everyone. As Coast Salish matriarch and elder, I wish to give a very warm thank you to all my relatives on the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh for welcoming me to live in the unceded lands of my relatives, the Musqueam, in Richmond for 40 years now. As Coast Salish matriarch and elder, I wish to give each and every one of you a very warm welcome. Not only did Wayson grow up here, his best-known novel, The Jake Peony, published in 1995, and his childhood memoir, Paper Shadows, in 1999, speak to his doing so. He belongs to this place who we are this evening. Wayson Choi is, in other words, not only a Vancouver and a British Columbian, but he's also a national treasure. to tell you, sometimes when I read my own books, I say, boy, did I have it easy, because all I had to do was write about the history. I didn't necessarily suffer it. I don't believe in suffering, first of all. Let's get this together here. And, uh, but I do believe that there were others before us, before your coming and your own coming, sacrifices have been made. Please remember if we aren't the ones who made the sacrifice, we have to remember those who did. Why? Because then this is why our life is meaningful. They thought we would matter. They thought we would make a difference, that we might be beloved and worthy of a country from which others may say, gosh, I wish I could get to Canada. And I was startled. <laughs> And I wasn't sure who said it, but it sounded like the voice of the old Chinese who occupied the Gimian John sausage factory where my father lived and where my mother lived. And I was raised while my mother made the Chinese sausages, string after string. There were so many phallic symbols in my life. I can't, I can't, well, that's why I'm a writer, of course. Symbols are very important, and as a gay man, I don't know. But I do know that, um, the miracle is that life is meaningful, and when you least think it is, think again. Somebody wants you to know that you matter. You see, it's not perfection that makes literature, it's our imperfection that makes perfection possible. So as Leonard Cohen said, you know, uh, in the darkness and so on and so forth, and there, there's a crack in the universe, well, that's how the light gets in. And today, I have to tell you, the world is ablaze for me. And I thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And take the books out and don't bring them back because they have to buy new ones. <laughs> All right? Thank you. Larry Wong, Wayson's childhood friend. Larry's here. He was on the committee. I was asked to be on the committee. Larry, could you stand up, please? Where are you? There you are. It was an incredible, yeah. Larry helped do some of the program. You organized dim sum with Wayson Choi that summer. We shared stories. And at the end of the program, we gave away a lot of those books of Jade Peony to people when Wayson spoke here for Word Vancouver on the Street. And one of the things afterwards that evening, uh, when Wayson was honored along with Paul Yee and Roy Ma, Wayson said, wow, this is great. He's, he's just honored that he and Larry could remember going down in Chinatown, going into Chinatown News, and being inspired by Roy on writing about our community. And who knew what could happen that he could be 
the Governor General's Award winner for um, All That Matters, because Waysen mattered to so many people. It's off to you. Thank you very much, and I'm very honoured. And thanks for the promotion to the Creative Writing Program. Uh, actually, I, I, I teach in the Department of English Language and Literatures and also in the Asian Canadian and Asian Migration Studies Program with Chris Lee, but I have a lot of good friends in creative writing. So if you'd like to have me teach over there too, that, that would be great. Um, I first met Wayson back in 1997 when he was in Vancouver, and he was undertaking research on his memoir, Paper Shadows, which was published in 1999. And I must say that meeting Wayson was really a, a pivotal moment for me. Wayson, as many of us know, always had strong ties to UBC's creative writing community and to its Department of English, connections which date back to his years as a student in the early 1960s. Known as Sonny Choi by the other aspiring writers in his English classes at UBC in these formative years, his class peers included, well, some well-known names, Fred Waugh, George Bowring, Frank Davey, Daphne Marlett. He says he was mentored quite generously, he said he was actually, he was spoiled, by Earl Burney, Jan De Bruin, and Jake Zilber. His short story, The Sound of Waves, was published in Prism, a journal edited by De Bruin and Jake Zilber. And uh, it was published in the Best American Short Stories of 1962. So that's going back far before the Jade Peony. After several works, uh, years of work and teaching in Ontario, Wayson took a sabbatical year after the death of his mother in 1977, and he returned again to UBC to undertake a creative writing seminar that was being taught by Carol Shields. She prompted him to write a story with a randomly selected slip of pink paper, according to Wayson. The resulting work symbolically focused on a pink jade amulet shaped like a peony provided the core motif that would eventually evolve into the jade peony published in 95. The Jay Peony was the co-winner of the 1995 Trillium Award, the 1996 Vancouver Book Award, and other books that explore the intricate patterns of family history followed in the, week, the, work, the wake of this initial success, including his Vancouver memoir, Paper Shadows, from 1999, which won the Edna Stabler Award for nonfiction, and the sequel to The Jade Peony, All That Matters, in 2004, which was shortlisted for the Giller Prize and won a Trillium Award. In 2009, he published another memoir that directly grappled with his own mortality and a special network of family support that was vital to his survival of a coma and heart attack. Not yet, a memoir of living and almost dying. All these works draw upon his distinctive experiences as a Chinese Canadian writer who has been in dialogue with the spirits of the past. Indeed, Wayson saw the shimmering spirits, not just in people, but within objects of his memory, those shimmering spirits that continue to exist in today's buildings in, in Vancouver's Chinatown, in remembered artifacts, in remembered articles of clothing. Throughout his work, he has restlessly magnified the intricate connections of his characters and himself to families and communities. And one of these themes in his memoir, most recently, not yet, has been that he has never been alone, never been alone, despite his singular life, that he counts himself fortunate in the support of his adoptive families, his godchildren, and his extended family of writers. Now, I'm gonna take you on a little time trip and go back to when my fabulous colleague, Dr. Chris Lee, who is now director of the Asian Canadian Asian Migration Studies Program, was but a second year undergraduate <laughs> and knocking on my door because he'd heard that I was teaching some courses in Asian North American writing. What second year undergraduate then proposes that he set up some connection to Wei Sin Choi? And that's just what Dr. Chris Lee 
from Brown University later, uh, did. He met Wason at the Seashell Authors Festival in, in the summer of 1997, and he urged Wason to meet Glenn Deere. He said, Glenn Deere is developing his courses in Asian North American Studies at UBC. You've got to meet him. So, uh, next thing you know, I'm on the phone to Wason, and we set up a lunch date. I drive our creaky wood-paneled Dodge Caravan van to the Zilber residence to pick up Wason, and his first comment on it is, oh, it's a, a wood-paneled van. How nice this is, and how roomy. Uh, we make our way then to Athene's restaurant on Broadway while talking nonstop about all the writers we mutually admire, Sky Lee, Denise Chong, Larissa Lai, and before we entered the restaurant, and this is typical of Wayson, he insisted that we stop at a secondhand consignment store. Might still be around there. Because he was always in search of used, um, elegant eyeglass cases. And I thought, well, how many glasses, pairs of glasses do you need? And he quickly explained, no, he always carries with him these number of these eyeglass cases, which are the practical holders of his vast array of fountain pens. Those are the instruments of his beautiful, flowing, cursive script, those signatures of elegant beauty that grace the inside sleeves, I bet, of most of the people in this room who have autographed editions of his, of his books. So that side trip in search of those containers for his collection of fountain pens was a sign of Wason's interest in symbols and in objects, in the rituals of everyday life. And then we proceeded to, to talk over souvlaki, pita, and tzatziki. And here's a sample of our conversation. So I, at this point, I, I asked Wason, um, when you were growing up, how did you become aware of the old China and the new one, and some of the tensions between being a Canadian and being Asian Canadian? I know that you talk about this in, in some of your writing. And Wayson then said, I grew up with some of those tensions as being part of the organic way one lives one's life, whether poor or rich, dark-skinned or light-skinned. I did not understand these were tensions in any conscious way until I was old enough to recognize that my confusion was a confusion of identity, of associations, of discovering boundaries and borders. And I think that this is why at the age of 57, I was 57 when I published this work, that's why I could finally write it, when I was going to be a writer. And I had early success, you know, in Best American Short Stories of 1962, but I didn't write from that point on. It was a lot of hard work. First, and second, what did I have to say in 1962? I felt I had nothing more to say. And there I was falling madly in love with all kinds of literature and writers at the University of British Columbia. It was not due to humility, but to an internalized oppression that I felt I had nothing to say. I could not understand what I was living through and still struggling with. I think when people are in the middle of those struggles, they don't have anything to say because you can't get a fix on anything. Your compass doesn't guide you. Luckily, I have lived long enough now that I can understand I have much to say, at least to myself, if not to anyone else. And then I asked him, so what did it feel like when your voice came back to you three years ago and you came back to writing a memoir and another novel? And then because he was writing the memoir, he said, well, I hope I can write it. I think that this voice never left me. This voice always said to me that I would one day write and tell stories, ever since I read Christian Andersen's stories as a child. But I did not understand when or under what conditions. I guess the voice that comes back to me now is the voice of some kind of authority that comes with arriving at senior age. And for better or worse, it helps me see more clearly what forms of human love and human disappointment may be about. One of the things this is about is the need to understand why one lives at all. He goes on to say, I really wanted to write a book about survivors. I wanted to write a book about people who were decent people who survived. So that was in September of 1997. In 1999, Having completed his memoir, Wayson returned 
to the classrooms and lecture halls at UBC where he was once a student and he returned as our honored guest, as a writer and lecturer. He generously visited my classrooms and including one course, English 426, which was being held in the Scarf Building, where Chris Lee, again, was a student in that class, um, along with uh, Janie Liu. Uh, those two were, were both in attendance in that class, who would go on to become uh, scholars in Asian North American writing. Uh, Chris Lee actually wrote one of the first important scholarly articles on the Jade Peony, published in 1999, in a special issue of the journal Canadian Literature, uh, for which I was, the, I was the guest editor. And I think this connection to the journal Canadian Literature um, is doubly meaningful because that journal was founded by George Woodcock in 1959, 60 years ago and Wayson himself received the George Woodcock Lifetime Achievement Award, as we know and as we've seen, bestowed in 2015 in this very location at this library, in the same room. So to honor the, our connection to Wayson, um, as an associate editor at Canadian Literature, I have brought free copies of that special issue of Canadian Literature that features the full interview it also uh, features a selection of other essays, including that first important scholarly article on the Jade Peony written by Dr. Lee. And these are freely available while quantities last at the front table to your left over there. And I would say this to Wayson, thank you, Wayson, we still hear you, thank you. It's really great to see all these friends and friendly faces here. Anyways, I'm going to start with a, a short reading from um, Paper Shadows, and it has to do with Wayson, the name Wayson. <clears throat> Think about your Chinese name, Mother always said to me, tapping my head. Think what it means. Your grandfather came from Victoria to give you that name. Six weeks after my birth, grandfather left grandmother and his family in Victoria and took the overnight ferry to Vancouver, where he proudly pronounced the formal name he had selected for his first grandson, Choi Wei Sun. A half dozen jade and gold baby bracelets ringed my crib as he said my new name aloud three times to a gathering of friends and relatives. Two Chinese characters grandfather selected for my name form a political motto, Wei Sun, that is, to rehabilitate, was an epigram from old China, a promise to reform old ways through peaceful means. Now, when I was a child, and Sonny was just a young man, he was this imaginary figure whose details I filled in by visiting his vacated, book-filled bedroom in southeast Vancouver with collections of pens, paper, rubber stamps, wax seals, cigarette holders, and all sorts of exotic paraphernalia. Something was evident then. He loved writing every aspect of it. He surrounded himself with the tools of writing and the written word. Pens of all kinds, simple dip fountain pens, elaborate Mont Blancs, high-tech Lamys, classic styled Parker 51s, regal Caran d'Aches, <clears throat> all gems to this pre-adolescent. I could go on about the wax seals, 100% linen paper stock, and all, that <clears throat> and all this had come to influence my love of the graphic arts and the printed word and page. He lived his life as a writer, honing his skills every day, every, in every aspect of his life. Teenage Wayson showed awesome <coughs> awareness of world affairs, politics, injustice, 
and accompanying ironies. His huge childhood piggy bank it was huge. Um, where he collected his earnings for his ever-increasing shopping habit was covered with groovy flowers. But also, it had anti-war and ironic slogans. Things like, Jesus saves here. Hands off Cuba. And it remains a treasured keepsake to my brother Jeff. In the 60s, in Vancouver, he drove his bright yellow VW wore long, hippie-like, shoulder-length hair and a goatee, the look that remained with him for life. For him, that time was not about mere fashion and trends. It was a time for change. His road to change was to hitchhike his way to Ottawa, the U.S. Embassy, a personal, solitary demonstration for the unfair immigration practices of the U.S., towards Asians and Asian Canadians. He had strong beliefs, he was committed, and he was ready to stand up for them peacefully. <clears throat> Main Street in Vancouver was once a fabulous array of used furniture, secondhand stores interspersed between the cafes, butcher and bake shops. And it was a favorite haunt for Wayson's treasure hunting, pens, doodads of all sorts, furnishings. And he had a style, and it was best described as eclectic. However, he had highly refined bargaining techniques. I often thought he was a non-discriminating consumer who delighted, who delighted in the bargain. He would browse a shop, then seemingly out of the blue, grab a bundle of pens and offer the shopkeeper an outrageously low price. And after some haggling, he would come away with a dozen or so pens, of which he would keep only one or two. I was puzzled, but he would explain later. <clears throat> I know that one or two of these items are worth major money. I just didn't want to tip off the shopkeeper. <laughs> Lesson, do your research. Observe and keep your cards close to your chest. His, his appetite for objects and special objects was enormous. I remember entering his top floor bedroom office, so crowded with bookshelves, art, and whatever his current fetish was, including butterflies, his watches caught my eye. Displayed, pinned up, hanging along the wall, precisely six inches on center, horizontally, encircling the whole room, each very beautiful in their own right. The vintage Hamilton, a tank watch, exotic brands from a Mickey Mouse themed Cartier, very pricey, <laughs> to whimsically priced Facos, purchased Facos, his name for knockoffs, all meticulously on display. No status discrimination among the 150 to 200 subjects lined up like soldiers. Another collection that deserves attention was his vast rubber stamp collection. Anyone who has received his, course, his correspondence has seen the result of his combined calligraphy and rubber stamp art. They beautifully embellished his words. I think you've seen some examples up there. Uh, maybe the strongest use of his technique was in conjunction with his teaching. Wayson, while a very patient and accepting teacher, was also, also had high expectations of his students. When he received a paper that a student had obviously put in insufficient effort, he had a special, in large, bold face rubber stamp that he inked up and stamped with the finality of a judge's gavel. Boom, bullshit. <laughs> message sent was the message received. Wayson was an impressive letter writer, and me, not so much. So to stay in touch, we had our late night telephone packed. After midnight, Pacific time, and of course it was 3 a.m. in Toronto at that time, he would be up working, refining his latest manuscript, adding flourishes to speaking notes, on and on. He was dedicated to his art. 
Writing for him was a process of refinement, reading, rewriting tirelessly. Refinement often meant streamlining and, and economy. As Mies said, more is less. <clears throat> True to his advertising roots, Wayson's life can be expressed as a series of campaigns. There's a message box and slogans. He always had a slogan, and there are two of them you may have heard before that I'd like to share with you because they are especially poignant in today's world. Family is who loves you. And love has no rules. I am proud to believe that he, Wayson, lived up to the hope given in his name. Change through peaceful means. In his teaching, in the way he treated others, the way he embraced ideas and ideals, the way he lived his ideas and ideals. He instigated change peacefully. <clears throat> um, to wrap it up, I'm, I'm going to finish as I began with some words from Wayson himself. As writers, and most importantly, as readers, I think you can relate. <clears throat> um, so this past April, my extended family, including my son Wayson, and I were vacationing in Palm Springs. Young Wayson at this time is not really a, a big reader, but by chance there was a copy of the Jade Peony at the house we were staying at. <clears throat> also by chance, it was Wayson's birthday. I thought, it's not late, let's call. It's very fortuitous. And, that, and Wayson was a strong believer in luck and fate. Anyways, we had a conversation that lasted close to an hour, all of us taking turns, and it eventually bled into an email exchange of which I would like to read an excerpt. From Wayson Choi, date April 27th, 2019. Subject, happy birthday. It's now a week gone by since I landed with a thud into my 80th year on April 20th, and equally good as the generous gifts of colorful orchids scrumptious home-baked cookies and cakes, dim sum, cafe lunches and steak dinners, I'm receiving the gift of knowing that young Wayson is, is reading moi. Totally delights me. Should he himself volunteer to let me know what he thought about all those words I wrote, that would be the cherry on the top of the cake. He writes, I do remember appearing before a grade nine class as the author. And the first young reader that popped up his hand to speak asked, why did you write those boring stories? <laughs> he had a say, frankly and brutally, as only a kid can. Then he said, but that one story, that one story made the whole book worthwhile because it reminded me of something in my own life. One never knows, but whenever a reader connects, even what I thought was a most in, inconsequential detail of a story, I am lifted to the skies. That reminds me of my little brother when he was sick, a student once told me. My mother told me to read that part, and then I just read the rest of the book. Every reader counts, and every reader's mother counts. Bless the, that mother. So thank you for coming and showing your respects to this wonderful, wondrous person, Wayson Sunny Choi. Thank you. I started when I was a teenager. I wrote my first story after rewriting it many times under the uh, beautiful tutelage and mentorship of Earl Burney and Jake Zilber from UBC in the 1950s. And finally that story, that single story, published in a high school journal, admired by high school teachers uh, in spite of the grammar, after which Earl worked on it and said to me, 
And did you want to be a writer? As I handed him the same manuscript, and he handed it back and said, well, punctuate. The uh, teacher for the short story course, famous even then in the 1950s and 60s, uh, was going to be Alice Munro. You see, you did what I did. <laughs> and I'm so glad. And for drama, I was going to have, in the last year of his life, it turned out to be, uh, Tennessee Williams. You see, who can blame me? Who can blame me? <laughs> but I was born lucky, as my grandfather said when he named me Wei Sun, which means to reform, to change for the better. And I am lucky. And luck works in strange ways. But what a joy. I hope that joy is part of it, and maybe a few tears. And if you are afraid of what this has opened up to you, Fear is the first reason to live your life boldly. Live it boldly. It's fun. It will shock people that deserve to be shocked. And at 74, I can say, it's a life. Bless you all. The point I want to make, though, is that you all contribute. And you know, you're most important as a writer when you are a reader. Because when you read and you say to yourself, this is a good book, and you get enchanted and you lose yourself in it, you know how you like to be. Lost in that world, within the first paragraph, the first page, the narrative voice takes over, you forget your reading words. This is what you've come to discover. What is your voice? What is your narrative voice? Because I know when you first write and you pass your page to anyone, you pretend you're cool. It doesn't really matter. Oh, it's not too good. And in your heart you're saying, it's a goddamn masterpiece. <laughs> when I'm bored, there are other people that are bored. But we come out of it. Something snaps us awake. We have to remember we're still alive. And the word makes us live. Thank you for sharing so much with me. You are wonderful. You are my friends. You are the heart of all that is invisible, that is essential. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've always thought it's very funny that my name is Alma Lee, since I'm as Scottish as you could be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did write a whole bunch of things down, but given what some of the, um, or what Greg and Jim said about Wayson collecting, I'm also a collector, and what I collect are hearts. And in my collection is a heart, beautiful jade heart, which Wayson gave me and which I, I really treasure in my collection. Because one of the things about Wason was that he was such a kind, thoughtful, and loving person. And I know that so many of you know that really well. Um, he had lots and lots of really kind, loving, and supportive friends, and people who truly loved him, to say nothing of the fact that he was a wonderful writer. I remember how excited he was when he came to Vancouver when I invited him to be part of the Writers' Festival program. It was a joy to meet him, and it was a joy to have him at the festival that year, and it was a joy to continue to have him as a friend. Um, what can I say about him? I think that one of the things that happens when somebody dies is they leave a hole in your heart. And I'm sure that many of you have a hole in your heart because of Wason's passing. I certainly have one in mine. But I have my beautiful jade heart to remind me that I don't have to have a hole in my heart because this one doesn't have a hole. Um, so I just 
really wanted to say that I'm honored to have been asked to speak here today. Um, and I really, I just wrote a really interesting little message on my butterfly that I picked up. And I think I would like to just end by saying what that message says. Mason, I hope you are flying on butterfly wings. Thank you. It is an honor to be here today with you speaking as Wayson's friend and the Vice President of Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, ACWW. My relationship with Wayson began as a reader for an analysis essay where I examined the unification of cultural dualities and their oppositional elements, symbolized through his turtle character, Lo Kui, which means old turtle in Chinese. My instructors encouraged me to share this essay with Wei Sin. And over the years, our friendship grew. I later began volunteering for ACWW, an organization with virtuous values that support Asian Canadians, develop their stories, and nurture them towards publication. Wayson was one of our honorary lifetime board advisors. Um, he was a catalyst of love, experiential wisdom, <laughs> and a creative storyteller to a global audience. Wayson had written to me before his passing, and I have decided to share this personal email today in hopes that his words will dispel the sadness and grief that we feel from losing him. Each time I read Wayson's letter, I hear his voice come through. His energy is very alive. <clears throat> On the afternoon of April 27th, Wayson wrote, Dear Eric, right after celebrating my birthday on April 20th, the curtain fell. Oops. Hen and I already noticed I've been using a cane on certain tired days. I sleep more, nap more, and feel too dopey to read the latest books, flip through the pictorial sections of magazines. Ugh. Well, just in the nick of coincidence, you have taken to studying dementia. Truly symbolic and foretelling, Eric. I just wish you could be with me in Toronto. I'd be your perfect subject. Read on. Yes, here's some unavoidable news, darkening but not tragic news. Yes, I'm more and more aware and alert to the fact of my need these days to navigate the rocky path of aging. Well, that's expected since I just turned 80, so wake up. Lucky I had the grace of feeling what I thought was capable and strong for so long. It allowed everyone around me to amuse me with my ideas of looking only 55. But it's obvious, even after my avoiding the obvious for so long, I'm now launching consciously like a lead balloon into my own special E-L-D-E-R years. Crash, boom, bang. <laughs> Still, thanks to my family of friends, there are still many life-affirming moments to live through and keep enjoying. But now I am aware of the shadow I cast over all those younger than I am. But now, Everyone around me, especially those five years younger or older than my 80 years, are discreet, caring about what's going on in my aging brain cells. I just hadn't paid attention that one does age. Golly, surprise. <laughs> Hang in there, I tell myself, as a good-hearted person gives me a bit of help out of the passenger seat of their low-slung foreign vehicle. 
I confess, it's such a shock these last few weeks, this awareness I have of what's happening to me. Meanwhile, Eric, if I forgot to tell you, I've just turned 80. <laughs> and now also have become a diagnosed member of those elders showing symptoms of dementia. Yes, I'm not escaping the inevitable. I have observed the aging signs in those younger than my 80 years, and certainly in my older friends and relatives. And now it's my turn to be forgetful, and my turn to the feelings of doubtfulness and of puzzlement. How did this all happen so quickly? I was just feeling so very confident, so optimistic. Well, I mean, what has vanquished that feeling so quickly? Why do I reach for my cane when I leave the house? Why is there an extra cane already in my car? Who's been leaving them there? <laughs> oh, did I tell you? Your emails came during my 80th birthday and added to my life of good friends and my good fortune with lively activists like you. You are a friend, and most assuredly, one of those special persons I appreciate very much. How lucky am I? Yours and creaking. Big hug, Wayson. Those were Wayson's last words um, to me. I never had the chance to respond. Uh, Wayson, you are in many hearts and loved by many. You are loved by me and will remain in my heart and mind. Till we meet again, Lokwai. <laughs> Wrapping up, I like to echo the words of one of my instructors from Vancouver Community College. He says, please let me know how Wayson's memorial is. Knowing what I know about him, he will be smiling at all who are there. From Wayson's book, All That Matters, I like to read, the master said, with words, all that matters is to express the truth. The Analects of Confucius. Rest in peace, Wayson, we love you. All my relations. I wrote a passage about the American Steam dry cleaning uh, place, which is at the corner, just across the street, but it happened in this, this four block corner that Chinatown existed for me. And in that dry cleaning, I was a child, and I was allowed to play in the uh, dry cleaning uh, establishment. The machines were dangerous, I'm sure, but somehow the gentleman just let me crawl around and press buttons and push this and that and try and watch the steam come out past my face. <laughs> he knew what he was doing and I caught on that it was fun. More fun to throw material at the steam and watch it blow up into the air. <laughs> and so I transferred that to my writing of fiction. And the children of the Jade Peony play in that dry cleaning uh, establishment all to honor the people of Chinatown who cared and raised this child who was me. It is a community to raise a child, and I think I took more than one community, because there was one called Strathcona, there was one called, oh, you will read the book, but there was Chinatown, of all things, the character that emerged the strongest of all. My name is Cindy Easting. I'm a second generation Vancouverite. As Winnie told you, I'm an author, member of the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, and owner of Cinda's Cookies. My mother was born in Canton and my father in Vancouver. Our family had two apartments above two family businesses, a grocery store, Yeastings IGA, and the Maple Leaf Bakery in the 1200 block of Davies Street in the West End. The bakery continues to operate today. We lived in one apartment with my Yin Yin, Toy San for paternal grandmother. She lived in the second one. Ningyin and I regularly took the bus to church in Chinatown 
and afterwards we would go sometimes to eat. We frequented the bakeries regularly. I also went to Chinatown often with various relatives to the Hong Kong Cafe for apple tarts, to see movies, eat at Ming's, WK Gardens, Yen Lok, or the Ho Ho Inn. My mother would take me to the Dollar Meat Store and other shops. Sometimes it would just be a special mom and me movie day. So in 1995, when The Jade Peony was published, I wanted to read it. I loved it. Wei Sun Choi understood me and us. He knew my world intimately as it was his world. I no longer felt so lost. Here was someone who truly understood me. I would like to share with you my favorite part of the Jade Peony. Today, if only the sun would peek out, if only it would not rain. I was going to delight Wong Sook with my best performance. I could see that Papa wanted Wong Sook to be pleased with me, if only because my performance would reflect on her. Wong Sook was only a few years younger than her 77 years. He was her equal. He was a man whose approval meant something. And Wong Sook had brought her daughter, her granddaughter, ribbons for her dreams. A princess. Popo understood the appeal and danger of dreams. She broke into a chain of half dialects. Too much playing, she said, shaking her head and rocking herself impatiently. Too much fancy, learn nothing. Then she used a kind of half English pigeon and half Chinese, which usually sent Wong Sook rollicking for he knew more English than Papa, but he was not here. This useless only granddaughter wants to be Shirley Temple La. The useless second grandson wants to be Cowboy La. The first grandson wants to be Charlie Chan. All stupid foolish. In China, jokes Liang, you no play act anything. She looked up at her obviously spoiled granddaughter. In China, they tie up your feet like this, with her hand, she made a tight, bent back fist. No can dancey. Well, I said in my best sense of dignity, mustering up the toy sunny's words, I'm only play acting for Wong Sook. This was a lie. I also play acted for myself, imagining a world where I belonged, dressed perfectly, behaved beyond reproach, and was loved, always loved, and was not, no, not at all Mo Young. I pulled at my chin and sucked in my thick cheeks to lengthen my look, just as stepmother and actress Anna Mae Wong always did. If Popo was going to launch into the story of the old days, the old ways, I wanted to escape. I did not have tap shoes with red ribbons, but as a little girl, I loved to dance, just like Wayson's first character, Juk Liang. Once I spun around so hard that I spun into the sharp edge of a desk and cut my cheek. I was quickly patched up by some aunties and told I was a silly girl. Not Mo Young this time, just silly. My book, A Memoir, from Michael Lovesinda was self-published in 2016. In 2007, I met Michael, also a second generation Chinese Vancouverite, on a dating website. He was living with stage four terminal cancer. We met and fell in love. Our story's not a sad one, but one filled with many family dinners and grocery shopping for the best, freshest seafood, meats, and vegetables. He would cook for me and I for him. We debated about which ingredients belonged in my family's tay tay, a pork-based steamed dumpling. My family's version was better. Falling in love with a second-generation Chinese Vancouverite gave me an unquenchable thirst for learning about my ancestry, getting back to Chinatown and my rich heritage. Food and family, after all, is what being Chinese is all about. One evening, as I lay in bed getting ready to fall asleep, I thought about Wei Sun Choi. I've been thinking about him for many days. What a gift and treasure he was. A storyteller, mentor, teacher, and an openly gay man. I Googled him and watched a video of him speaking at the Ontario Writers Festival in 2012, the one you just saw. I fell asleep feeling inspired. I woke up at 3.30 a.m. and could not sleep, so I started to reread The Jade Peony. As I read, I recalled the familiar characters, Chinese words, and phrases. Reading made me relive all the best memories of my childhood. Later that morning, I received an email from Alan Cho asking me if I would say a few words about Wei Sun Choi. I told him I would love to, that I'd read The Jade Peony many years ago and had purchased a copy recently, as I always meant to read it again. So, like Wei Sun Choi, I'm also lucky. If I'd not met Michael, I would have not written my book, 
become a member of the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, and I would not be here today speaking to you. Thank you. So I'm just going to say some very personal things about Wason and try to remember to call him Wason and not Sonny because that's how we grew up. Um, I've known Sonny most of my life. He was a student in the creative writing program that Earl Burney and my father started. And um, he became an important person in my life in 1961 when he babysat me and my brother, Mike, um, while my father went away uh, for a week or so to finish up his degree at the University of Washington. I was six and Mike was two, and I guess Wayson must have been in his very early 20s at that time. And interestingly, I asked Mike if he would write some words also about this, and we came up with exactly the same incident that we remembered at uh, the same time, which stuck in our minds, and he was only two. Um, what I remember particularly is how, despite my young age, Wayson treated me as a real person, worthy of respect and uh, being, being treated as a serious individual. Um, he even asked my advice on how to deal with my brother when he didn't want to take a bath. And uh, I said, oh, just, you know, just put him in. He always does that. He'll be fine once he's in the water. And it was true. Um, in the years that followed, Wason included me in his extended family, taking me for red bean shakes in Chinatown and introducing me to sesame candies and including the Zilbers, all of us, in his family get-togethers. There were really too many acts of kindness that Sonny showed to my family, Wayson showed to my family, for me to recount them all. But I think I will briefly mention one other incident that I think illustrates his rare ability to make people feel special and important. When my son was in his early teens, um, Wayson was writing The Jade Peony, and he asked Philip to read a chapter and give him his feedback, which he did. And just as he had with me when I was six, Wayson treated my 13-year-old son's input with the utmost respect and gratitude, and telling him how helpful and insightful it was. Sonny was a gentle and generous soul, and I will always miss him. And that is all I'm going to say. I'm now going to read what my brother sent. So this is Michael Zilber writing from hot Los Angeles. Um, he says, it would take something at least as long as a chapter in one of his novels to capture Wayson fully, so I will not try. Suffice to say, we loved him profoundly, and we're so glad he chose us as part of his voluntary family. He spoke to me so reverently and affectionately about my father, Jake, and mother, Alice, and I realized fairly recently that he is my earliest existing memory. Piecing it together years and years later, it would have been Christmas or so of 1961. Our parents went down to Seattle, and he and his girlfriend of the time, I believe Karen was her name, were babysitting and house-sitting. So, yes, Wayson, uh, we always called him Sonny, had a girlfriend, so 1961 sounds about right. He gave me a ride on his feet, swinging me round way up in the air, and it was jo joyful fun. Doesn't sound li like much of a memory, except I think it's a metaphor for the Sunny I knew, always riding high in the air, swinging around joyful and loving. Although thoughtful, insightful, generous, compassionate, and wise. When I was around 18 and had begun writing music in some kind of earnest, he smiled gently in a, at a family gathering and said, a composer, I love it. How did he know so early? 
through my adventures in Boston, New York, and San Francisco, through joy, the joy and hope of my first marriage and our wonderful son, through the rocky shoals of my first marriage ending and his warm pleasure that I have found someone new and she and I share a life, Wason has always been a rock, a warm hug, and a truly other-centered person who always made sure to find time for his own creative genius. So whether I think of him as a godfather, a favored uncle, or a wise friend or brother, I join everyone who is there in person and many more around the world in thanking whatever higher power there may be that he was a treasured part of my family. We love him. Thank you. Um, Wayson, without teaching me in a formal way, I've never a student of his, uh, has actually taught me a lot. And one of the things that I have learned from him is to believe that the narrative is a powerful tool. And he's demonstrated how you can reach across many boundaries, whether it is a linguistic, a cultural, and ethnic, um, different systems, different ways of looking at the world. You have a lot of differences that separate people, but through the, through the power of storytelling, you can touch each other's heart. And I have witnessed that again and again, because um, twice I had the occasion to invite him from Ontario to come to BC to speak. And um, the very first time I anticipated, I was nervous that time, because we knew that his approach might be controversial to some people. Uh, there were some young people on campus who were very radical. And uh, we, the, this is part of a conference, a race relations conference. And everybody wanted Wayson. But Wayson wanted to pick a topic and that was um, the racist in me. So he takes a very personal approach. And this, this did not sit well with some of the uh, young people, even on our own committee. So that very morning, even though it's a Sunday morning at a conference, um, originally he was scheduled at a very, very good time on the program. But people came to me and said, since you invited him, I want your permission to move him, of course, with his consent, move him to Sunday morning, because he can attract a full house, even though it's Sunday morning. So we didn't mind. So we move him to Sunday morning. And before that, he was also talking to me about, I'm not a scholar. This is a scholarly conference. And I said, no, I believe that if you just be yourself, you are able to, to reach out to a lot of people. So. At the end of the conference, I was told by the young woman on our steering committee, she said, I'm very pleased I stayed until the end of his speech. A bunch of us came in already feeling very negative and even antagonistic, because they didn't like his approach on this topic. And three of them walked out as soon as he started and set the stage. And this one stayed behind, and she wrote an email, which I share with Wayson afterwards. She said, boy, am I lucky I decided to stay? Because in my way of looking at the world, which is a binary one, Wayson showed me there are so many different ways of relating to people that this world is not a binary world. So to me, that was the best out of that conference. So I've stopped here. I have many other um, opportunities where I saw how he moved people who were so different from him. This is quite wonderful actually because they were playing a Chinese opera of sorts and they should have had that because I grew up with the Chinese opera in the background. When I found out that I was adopted in 1995, uh, it turns out that my father was a member of the Cantonese Opera Company. So I welcome the extra noise because you can hear whatever you think you want to hear. 
It's been so much fun writing about burning the Chinese school down. And yet, even that bitter experience for me meant that one day it would bloom into something that made Chinatown real. So I thank you all. My life as a person, as a gay person, as a son, as an adopted son, as a friend, as a member of two families in Toronto, one in Toronto and one in Caledon. Chinatown is not pure, it is not perfect. Some of the rich people that have come entitled from other countries, and I need to add from China, have protested at schools where the Jade Peony is taught. Apparently some of the teachers tell me they complain that this is a story about peasants. We're not peasants. And it wasn't a story to them about human beings. They don't read the book, they just don't like it. But their family members read it, their children read it, and I get the response that eventually the family is divided between the new history, the new wave of those who come over here who don't have to struggle because we struggled before them, and the histories of those who, for example, like friends like Mei Chu, Larry Wong, King, oh my gosh, all of you are in this room, the Lees, we are saying to them, we're not as good as you, we're not as bad as you, we are the survivors upon which you stand, and we ain't sitting down. <clears throat> so, as I said at the beginning, as I told my friends, I'm going to be humble tonight, but I can't be because you're here and I thank you. You give my life meaning because you tell me I have been something to somebody and it happens to be you. Thank you so much. Thank you readers. Thank you to those who don't read but who buy the book. <laughs> and I can only say I love you all for all the reasons that make it worthwhile. Thank you.